was five years old, my school had a spelling bee. The teachers came around to each classroom and explained not only the academic benefits of participating in the spelling bee, but how the winner would receive a shiny new trophy with a bright painted bumblebee on top. I signed up immediately. You see, I'd been reading a lot of Nancy Drew and Junie B. Jones novels, and I was convinced that nobody in school was better at spelling than I was. After weeks of practicing, the day of the spelling bee finally arrived. In the fluorescent light of my school's multi-purpose room, I could see the faces of everyone who was there watching me, from parents to teachers, staff, and students from all grades. As time went on, I found myself one of two finalists vying for that coveted trophy. My competition? My own close friend, Fantulu, who'd worked equally as hard and was as equally enthralled with the trophy. When my name was called, I took a deep breath, stepped up to the mic, and tried to ignore the ocean of eyes pointed on me. If I'm being honest, I don't remember the word I was given to spell. But what I do remember is that I misspelled that word by one letter. In my wake, Faye and Tulu got up and spelled the word perfectly, winning the spelling bee. As I stood on the stage clapping for my friend, I tried hard to swallow the huge lump that had formed in my throat. Fantulu was taking pictures with the trophy held high above her head. Everyone was walking up to her telling her, congratulations, you did such a good job, you should be so proud. They were telling me the same thing but with a much more pitiful tone like, congratulations, you did such a good job, you should be so proud. There was no trophy for second place. I bit back the tears stinging my eyes and tried to make it out of the building without being even more embarrassed than I already was. In the privacy of my mom's car, I let my tears fall. I couldn't understand how I'd worked so hard and fell short of everything by one letter. To cheer me up, my mom took me to the mall and let me pick out three new charms for my yellow Crocs. Needless to say, in my five-year-old mind, all was forgotten. But the day of the spelling bee would stick with me. Because for the next 14 years of my life, I never earned a trophy for any competitive achievement, athletic, academic, or otherwise. And as silly as it sounds, I thought the fact that I'd never earned a trophy proved my mediocrity. My sophomore year at Prairie View A&M University, two upperclassmen I knew encouraged me to try my hand at the debate team. I had no experience, so I spent an additional two days training and learning outside of our actual practices. And at my first tournament, I lost every single round I competed in with the exception of one. When I got the news, I figured I should quit. Less embarrassing to not debate at all than to keep losing and failing in front of everyone. At my second competition, I unsurprisingly had a chip on my shoulder. I felt that I had everything to prove. And in my first round of the day, my opponent did something that I'd never experienced before in debate. Spreading. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the debate world and what spreading is, allow me to demonstrate. Spreading is when you talk really fast because you make sure you lay out all of your arguments and respond to all of your opponent's arguments. Because if you drop your opponent's arguments, that means you lose a round. So you don't care if anyone can understand what you're saying or write down what you're saying. You just talk really fast. You don't stop for breath or air or take any breaks. You just keep on spreading. As my opponent proceeded to spread on me for the duration of her seven-minute speech, I started sweating in my suit. My paper was blank. I couldn't write responses to her arguments when I couldn't understand a word that was coming out of her mouth. As I stood up for my final speech, I felt the icy gaze of my opponents on me and they froze me in place. Stammering through that speech, I couldn't help but feel like a five-year-old girl again, failing in a room full of people with their eyes pointed on me. Except this time, 
I didn't have the strength to stop the tears. Before my speech even ended, I started crying. After the round, word spread to my teammates about what had happened, and they met me in the bathroom where I was still wiping away tears. They pulled me into a group hug and gave me a little pep talk. They said, Maya, I know it's hard, girl, but you gotta stop crying. They don't always like to see black girls like us at tournaments, and they don't always play fair. But we are strong black women, and we are not gonna let this get us down. You got this, girl. I will forever be grateful for the encouragement that my teammates provided me that day. And there, in the bathroom, I decided that I'd forget winning for the rest of the tournament since I obviously had no chance of that. Instead, I talked about things that mattered to me, like police brutality. I used relevant cultural examples that I felt comfortable discussing, like Medea's family reunion. <laughs> that evening, at the award ceremony, I glued my butt to my seat. I didn't want to get my hopes up when my name wasn't going to be called. Until it was. Fifth place in extemporaneous speaking, Maya McFarlane. As I walked to the front of the room to claim my small blue trophy with a little gold surfer on top, I was ecstatic. I could feel my blood rushing through my veins and flooding my cheeks. I could hear my heart beating loudly, proudly in my chest because I was no longer trophyless. I'd finally proven that I was smart enough to win one of those coveted statues, even if it was for fifth place. And I thought that that little gold surfer finally freed me from the burden of having to prove how smart I am. As my debate career went on and I achieved more success, more titles, and more trophies, I quickly learned that the success only made the burden worse. My fear of failure got worse. I started to worry what would happen if I didn't place at the next tournament. I started to worry people would say, See, I always knew she wasn't that smart anyway. Or, I always knew she only won by luck. I'm not sure if this is imposter syndrome anonymous, but hi, my name is Maya and I suffer from imposter syndrome. Despite all of my accolades, despite my 4.0 GPA, despite all of the hard work that I've invested, and despite being accepted to some of the best law schools in this country, I still frequently worry that I am a fraud. The Harvard Business Review defines imposter syndrome as a series of feelings of inadequacy that persists despite evident success. Someone experiencing imposter syndrome might have symptoms of repetitive self-doubt, feelings of intellectual fraudulence, and a grave fear of failure. Someone with imposter syndrome doesn't necessarily have low self-confidence or low self-esteem. More than anything, it means that a person holds themselves to an unreasonably high standard of perfection. And they believe that most, if not all of their success has been granted to them by luck, not merit. While it was always clear to me that I had always suffered from imposter syndrome. For the longest time, I couldn't understand where my drive for perfection came from. One of my favorite television shows of all time is Scandal. The representation of a strong black woman with her own firm was very encouraging to me as a teenager. In case you didn't know, black women account for less than 3% of all attorneys in the United States, according to the American Bar Association. In the first episode of season three, we meet heroine Olivia Pope's father. In a very intense monologue, he asks her, how many times have I told you, you have to be what? Quietly, Olivia says, twice as good. Yes, twice as good to get half of what they have, he repeats. By they, Papa Pope means white people. As the scene goes on, it's clear that Olivia is fighting tears but refuses to let them fall. 
For so many black women, myself included, this scene hit extremely close to home. I can remember my mom, dad, aunts, and even family friends telling me the same thing about having to work twice as hard as a black woman. This episode of Scandal is one in a very long list of examples that promotes the image of the strong black woman. The late author, black feminist, activist, and professor Bell Hooks once said, as objects, one's reality is defined by others, one's identity created by others, one's history named only in ways that define one's relationship to those who are subjects. Now, black women have been objectified by broader society and the white power structure, yes, but black women have been and continue to be objectified by black men and arguably worst of all, each other. Dr. Cheryl Witzgiscombe conducted a 2010 study aimed at analyzing the effects of the strong black woman image on black women's mental and physical health. In her study, Dr. Giscombe found that the strong black woman image is comprised of five primary elements. One, obligation to present an image of strength. Black women in Dr. Giscombe's study reported being perceived as the strong one by others and that they were expected to be the strength of their families. As black women, we are expected to be the stoic, emotional, and physical support for others, or else we aren't being good little strong black women. Two, feeling an obligation to suppress emotions. Black women are expected to keep our emotions hidden and bottled up. In fact, many of us believe that expressing emotions publicly is a sign of weakness. Even at five years old, I knew not to cry in front of everyone after losing the spelling bee, or else I'd never have any hope of becoming a good, strong black woman. Three, resistance to being vulnerable. Black women often find it difficult to be vulnerable and don't know how to accept help. We don't want others to think that we don't know how to do something or that we don't know how to get something done, because if they think that, they'll think we aren't good, strong black women for a drive to succeed despite limited resources. Women in Dr. Giscombe's study reported routinely working late, neglecting taking breaks, sacrificing sleep, and even putting their own health in danger in order to achieve their goals. As black women, we feel that we have to be the best. There's no room for failure or else we aren't being good, strong black women. Five, an obligation to help others. Black women frequently overcommit ourselves to responsibilities in our jobs, families, communities, and professional organizations. We feel that it's our responsibility to make sure everyone else's needs get met. We put ourselves last on the priority list because if we don't, we aren't being good, strong black women. Growing up as a little black girl in a society that presents the image of the strong black woman as a positive standard to aspire to, it was inevitable that I would develop imposter syndrome. The problem with the strong black woman trope is that it dehumanizes black women. Under this image, we aren't permitted the ability to express the full range of human emotion, the time necessary to adequately care for ourselves, or the most human characteristic of all, mistakes. The same standard of perfection that made me a good, strong black woman caused me to suffer from a crippling fear of failure and relentless self-doubt. Plus, I couldn't even process my feelings surrounding this fear because I was taught to keep suppressing those emotions. The image of the strong black woman is harmful. It removes black women from intrinsically human characteristics and paints us as objects,
capable of enduring ridiculous amounts of suffering without even feeling it. The same rhetoric has been used to justify the oppression, sexual abuse, and exploitation of black women for centuries. Calling me a strong black woman isn't a compliment. As a black woman myself, I reject and I resent the image of the strong black woman presented to me by society. Outliers aren't perfect, but they don't let others tell them who they are. They know for themselves. Redefining my identity outside of the limits of the strong black woman, fearlessly being myself outside of these limits and loving myself outside of these limits is my everyday form of activism. I believe that we all have the power to become outliers by embracing the power of radical self-definition. I wish I could tell you how to overcome imposter syndrome. In all honesty, I'm still learning how to battle it myself. But when imposter syndrome does strike, I try to remember that it is not my responsibility to fulfill society's or anyone else's ideas about who I should be. I try to remember that I could never be an imposter as long as I remain true to myself. And so sometimes that might mean I fail. I cry and I have to take time for myself. I experience pain, grief, anger, stress, anxiety. So what? Who I am is a walking testament to black womanhood existing outside of a dehumanizing linear spectrum. And to some people who have never witnessed all that magic with their own eyes, I do imagine it is pretty imposterous. But that is not my problem. If I could speak to my five-year-old self outside of the spelling bee, I would tell her, I love you. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make a mistake. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be better than everyone else. You just have to be the best version of you. It's okay to cry. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel embarrassed. But failing does not make you a failure. You don't have to be a strong black woman. You just have to be Maya. And I promise, as you get older, you'll find she is much cooler and more phenomenal than you could ever imagine. My name is Maya McFarlane, and thank you for listening to my TED Talk.